I give my life for Thee, e my precious blood I shed, that Thou my strong son be, and quickened from the dead I give I give my life for thee what has thou given for me I give I give my life for thee. What has thou given for me? I spent long years for thee in weariness and That an eternity of joy thou mightest know. I spent, I spent long years for thee as thou spent one. For me, I spent, I spent long years for thee, as thou spent one for me. My father's womb of light, my I let for night and for one and I let I let it Thou let hold for I let, I let it all for thee, as thou let hold for me. I suffered much for thee more than thy tongue can tell oh Petrus Adoni eat to rescue thee from hell upon I bore it all for thee. What hast thou borne for me? I bore, I bore it all for thee. What hast thou borne for me? Thou givest, 
thou givest thyself for me. Now I give all for thee. Thou givest, thou givest thyself for me. Now I give all for thee. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time. Thank you for reminding us that Jesus came into this world. He left the glory circle throne. He left his Father from above to suffer the bitterest of agony just for us. That we might not go to hell, that he might save us from the judgment to come. Lord is asking us now, is given everything for us. What are we giving him? Lord, we promise you our life our soul, our mind, everything that we have, our time, we give everything to you, accept it in Jesus' name. We're praying that the blood is shed on the cross of Calvary will be efficacious for every one of us in Jesus' name. And we pray that that blood, precious blood, spotless blood, holy blood, the blood of Jesus Christ shed on the cross of Calvary will make us clean, will make us pure will sanctify us, will make us so holy, will be acceptable in the sight of the Father, in Jesus' name. We we'll pray, Lord, for the rest of our lives. Be loyal and faithful and obedient to you in everything. Thank you, Lord, because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. In Matthew chapter 26, I'm reading to you from verse 28. Matthew chapter 26, verse 28. Here are the words of Jesus Christ himself. As he said, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. I'm sure you understand where we are at now. Jesus is passing through the last week. That he spent on earth just before he went to the cross. In fact, the betrayal is very near. And then the crucifixion will be very, very near. And he will be nailed to the cross of Calvary. He will shed his blood. He wanted his disciples to know that everything about salvation, everything about getting to heaven, everything about taking them from earth to heaven to glory will depend upon this dying on the cross. And because of that, he observed the Passover with them. But he moved away from the Passover and he went into the Lord's Supper. And then he told them, here is the bread, it's my body, it's broken for you. Because just some hours after this time, he said, will be bruised for the crown of thorns. And then his hands will be pierced, and his legs will be pierced, and his side will be pierced, his body will be broken. And then he said, this is my blood, he will shed his blood, in fact, Every drop of blood in his body will be shed. Because when the spear is thrown to the side, water and blood came out. No more blood. All the blood was drained out. For your salvation, for my salvation. And he said, this is my blood. Actually, this is the representation of my blood. This is what the Old Testament sacrifices have been pointing to. And he said, it's of the new covenant of the New Testament. There's a new agreement with the Heavenly Father. Well, the shedding of this blood, I become the Savior. I become a substitute. I become the sin bearer. And everyone that will depend upon me and trust in me and believe and have faith in the shed blood that is going to be shed on the cross of Calvary, the sins will be remitted. The sins will be blotted out. The sins will be pardoned. The sins will be forgiven. Salvation is coming. Reconciliation with God is coming. Righteousness is coming through the shedding of the blood of the Lamb. And he said, it's shed for many. And for the remission, the removal, the pardon, the forgiveness of sins. As Jesus said this. He was referring to what was said at the beginning when he was, when he was to be born. Do you remember that when Mary the Virgin was conceived of the Lord Jesus Christ, Joseph, knowing that Mary was a pure woman, holy woman, sinless woman, was wondering... How did this happen? 
And then he thought maybe a kind of sin had been committed somehow. And he was thinking of putting Mary away privately. Being a just man. And then the angel of the Lord came unto him, unto Joseph, and said, Joseph, don't be afraid to take your wife unto you, because that which you see in her is of the Holy Ghost. In fact, she shall bring forth a son. Look at it, Matthew chapter 1. And in verse 21, she shall bring forth a son. And thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. He was born. He lived the holy life, a sinless life. And now he was going to the cross, he was going to Calvary, and was going to offer himself for our redemption, for our salvation. And now just before that, he told his own disciples, he said, take this cup. Is a cup of the new covenant. And my blood is represented in what you see in that cup. This is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for the remission, the removal, the forgiveness, the pardon of sins. How does a person become forgiven? By the blood of Jesus. How is the sin in somebody's life totally removed? The blood of Jesus. How is the dead and the stain in the heart cleansed? The blood of Jesus. How will all our guilt and condemnation be blotted out by the blood of Jesus? How about the penalty for sin? The punishment for sin? How will that be taken away and cancelled? It is by the blood of Jesus. How are we purchased? How are we redeemed? And we are made members of the body of Christ? It is by the blood of Jesus. In Acts of the Apostles chapter 20. Acts chapter 20, reading from verse 28. Take heed, therefore, unto yourselves, and to all the flock, over the which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers, to feed the church of God, which he has purchased with his own blood. You are not a part of a church of the living God until you have been cleansed by the blood. Until you have been purchased and redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. You see, there are some people, they think they become members of the church by turning over a new leaf. That will not make it. They think that they will come into the body of Christ and they become members of the family of God by making some resolutions uh, in the New Year Eve, watch night service. That will not make it either. And they think they'll be able to make it by giving some money to the beggars. That will not make it. Except you are purchased by the blood of the Lamb. That you see, that the Lord had said, When I see the blood, I will pass over you. The guilt in you. The condemnation in you. The pollution in you. The corruption in you. And the condemnation in your heart and on your conscience cannot be cleansed away and taken away. Except by the blood of the Lamb. That's why you are told in Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9, reading from verse 22. Hebrews 9, verse 22. And almost all things are by the Lord purged with blood. And without shedding of blood is no remission. It's no remission. That is removal of sin. He's talking about this funny to the Old Testament. And actually, in the Old Testament... The new covenant, the New Testament, is concealed. And in the New Testament, the Old Testament is revealed. That means all the sacrifices in the Old Testament, actually, they are pointing to something in the New Testament, in the New Covenant. And in the Old Covenant, it says, almost all things are by the law, purged with blood. That means as you go into the tabernacle in the Old Testament and you go into the outer court and you go into the inner, uh, inner chamber of the division of the, of the tabernacle, it is by the blood. You sprinkle the blood upon all those utensils and things there. Only then were they purified, were they sanctified, were they set apart, made ready, acceptable in the sight of the Lord. And then he says, even the people from the priest, the high priest, to the priests and to the Levites that are ministering, 
They had to be sprinkled by the blood. And also the people of Israel on the day of atonement, they had to be sprinkled by the blood. It was the blood sprinkled upon them that will make them acceptable to the Lord. And then you have the removal, the blotting out, the remission of their sins. And that's the reason as you come now to the new covenant. And you see that the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, is died for us. And because he has died for us, he has shed his blood for us. If we are going to be clean, if we are going to be acceptable in the sight of the Lord, it takes the blood of the Lamb that is sprinkled upon you by faith. And then you are made righteous, you are made clean in the sight of the Lord. I'm talking to you today on the power in the blood of Jesus. Power in the blood of Jesus. I divide the message to three parts. Number one. Salvation and peace through the blood of Jesus. Salvation and peace through the blood of Jesus. Number two, sanctification and purity through the blood of Jesus. Sanctification and purity through the blood of Jesus. Number three, security and protection. The security and the protection of believers from judgment. The security and the protection. Of believers from judgment. Come back to number one. Number one is salvation and peace through the blood of Jesus. As you look at this statement of Jesus Christ, precious statement, important statement, in Matthew chapter 26, verse 28, and you see what Jesus Christ is saying concerning his own blood. He said, This is, this is. My blood of the New Testament. That's why you don't go back to the Old Testament again now. You see, there are some, they call themselves churches in the sight of God. They are not churches. And they are still killing goats and rams and animals. Although they read the Bible, they go back to the Old Testament. And then they will use the blood, sprinkle it here, sprinkle it there. They think they are being the Bible, but it says the culmination, the conclusion of all the animals that were killed in the Old Testament, everything is centered on Christ. And when the pure blood of Jesus, the holy blood of Jesus, the spotless blood of Jesus, when it was shed on the cross of Calvary, that cancelled all the other animals that were being killed. All that is not necessary anymore because it says, This is my blood of the new covenant, the new testament, which is shed for many. For the remission of sins. When it says many, many in many places, many in many countries, many in many generations. From that time until the Lord will come. That as many as will come to the Lord Jesus Christ and they will believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And they will have faith on the blood that Jesus shed on the cross of Calvary for them and for the whole world. The Bible says they will be forgiven. Their sins will be taken away and they will be redeemed. It tells us in First Peter chapter 1. First Peter chapter 1, reading from verse 18. It says, For as much as ye know, that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold, from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, the precious blood of Christ, precious in the sight of God, Precious in the sight of angels. Precious in the sight of believers. Precious in every generation. Precious until this day. Precious until the last soul will be saved and will get to heaven. The precious blood of Jesus Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. And that's the blood of Jesus that redeems us. That's the blood of Jesus that cleanses us. That's the blood of Jesus that takes all our sins away. I come back to that Hebrews again. Hebrews chapter 9, reading from verse 7. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 7. It tells us in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 7, it says, But into the second wench, the high priest alone, once every year, not without blood, not without blood, the blood of 
animals. At that time in the old covenant, now with the blood of Jesus, which he offered for himself and for the errors of the people, for the sins of the people. And when the people have sinned, and they have missed the mark, and they have gone astray, and they have done something that the Lord said we must not do. Guilt will come. Condemnation will come. With that, condemnation, penalty, judgment will come. The wrath of God, indignation of God will come. If they wanted to be free from that wrath and that indignation, there's something they have to do. They have to make an atonement. And the atonement will mean the shedding of the blood of an animal that will now take their sins away. You know why? Because they should have died. But then the animal died in their place. They should have died. But the animal died as a substitute for them. They should have died. But the animal died as a replacement for them. That's exactly what Jesus Christ has done. We should have died. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And the wages of sin is death. The soul that sinners, it shall die. We should have died. But then Jesus died in our place. He was our substitute. He was our replacement. And he took our punishment away. He went in with blood to be offered for himself and for the errors of the people. That's why it says in conclusion in that verse 22 of chapter 9 of Hebrews, And almost all things are by the Lord purged with blood. And without shedding of blood is no remission, no removal of sin, no forgiveness of sin without the shedding of the blood of Jesus Christ. And you know there are some people, they think they are honoring Jesus Christ, and they say, well, I don't know about his death, I'm not concerned about his death, but I like his life. He lived a good life, he lived a righteous life, he lived an honest life, and I will do my best to live like Jesus. My friend, that's not enough, that's not enough, because even if you try to live like Jesus from now on, until you die. I about the sin you committed in the past. I about the atrocities you did in the past. I about your crimes in the past. I about the punishment of God upon your head because of what you did in the past. That's why you need the blood of Jesus. So that because he has borne your punishment, you'll be able to say his blood makes atonement for my sin. In Leviticus chapter 17. Leviticus chapter 17, reading from verse 11. Leviticus 17, verse 11. For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that maketh an atonement for the soul. It's the blood. The blood. The blood of Jesus now. How are we cleansed from sin? That is, our souls are sin stained. Our souls have been defiled by sin. How are we cleansed? The blood of Jesus. How do we get pardon, forgiveness? Because we are feeling guilty. We are feeling condemned. The blood of Jesus. We have been separated by God because it says your sins have separated between you and your God that you will not hear. How do we then get reconciled with God? The blood of Jesus. How are we going to have peace? Because the sinner does not have peace. It says, there is no peace to the wicked, says my God. How are we going to have the peace of God and be free from this burden and this load and this condemnation and this guilt? Is the blood of Jesus. How are we going to silence the persecutor, the accuser of the brethren? The one that, that's the devil, that's accusing you day and night before the Almighty God sin, is a sinner. Kill him. Is a sinner. Destroy him. Is a sinner. Judge him. Is a sinner. Let your wrath come upon him. How are you going to silence that persecutor, the accuser? By the blood of Jesus. How are you going to plead before the throne? And you come to the Lord and you say, Lord, I'm pleading. On what basis are you pleading? Or oh, because I go to church? Ah, that will not get it. Or oh, because I read the Bible? That will not make it. How are you going to plead before the throne of God? That God will say, yes, I hear, yes, I understand, yes, I forgive. It's by the blood of 
Jesus. If you look at uh, Romans chapter 3, Romans chapter 3, I'm reading from verse 23. In Romans chapter 3, verse 23, here is what the Word of God is telling us. It says, For all have seen and come short of the glory of God. All have seen and come short of the glory of God. Uh, there are some people that they don't understand uh, that word seen. Seen. They don't understand. And they define sin their own way. They describe sin their own way. And they may do some things that Almighty God is going to judge them for, but they are going about with a smile. They do not know they have done anything sinful because their definition of sin is not God's definition of sin. Their description of sin is not God's description of sin. And you know that, that your ignorance is not an excuse before the law of the land. If you did something wrong against the constitution of the land, against the law of the land, and then the law enforcement agencies cut you and you are brought to the court, and you plead before the judge, you say, Judge, you know what? I didn't know it was wrong. I didn't, I've never seen the constitution of the country in my life. I've never read the laws of the land in my life. What did I know? I didn't know anything. You're still guilty. And you'll be judged. According to that law, that you said you are ignorant, doesn't mean anything. All have seen and come short of the glory of God. What is seen? Turn with me to Romans chapter 1. In Romans chapter 1, reading from verse 28. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. Do you know that God gives people over to a reprobate mind, a dull mind, a seared mind, a seared conscience? That they've been doing the thing over and over and over until they convince themselves that, well, I've been doing it for a long time and God didn't kill me. I've been doing it for a long time and God didn't smash my head. I've been doing it for a long time. I, I don't even feel guilty about it now. God has led that individual to a reprobate mind. He does that. He does that. And you look at verse 24. Wherefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness. He gave them up. And there are people that practice uncleanness, immorality. They don't know it is sin. Their conscience is not rebuking them, condemning them anymore. They are given over. In verse 26, for this cause, God gave them over unto, God gave them up unto vile affections. Dirty affections. And they may be writing dirty letters to people's wives, not their own wife. And they may be writing dirty letters to ladies and to girls. And in the church or outside the church or in the office. And they don't feel anything wrong. They still come to church. They still read the Bible. They still mix with the people of God. And they say, do you say that is wrong? I don't feel guilty at all. God has given you over. That's terrible. In verse 28, it says, And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient, the things which are not proper, the things which are not right in the sight of God. That's sin. How do you know them? How do you describe them? Verse 29, being filled with all unrighteousness. Anything unrighteous. The opposite of righteousness. Fornication. You see that? Boys here, girls here. Do you see this? They call it a me boyfriend, girlfriend. And they say, well, we have agreed together. We're going to marry in the future. That's why we're messing up now. Because after all, we're still going to marry in the future. And does it matter? It matters a lot. That is sin. Judgment of God is coming. Except you are washed in the blood of the Lamb. Fornication. Wickedness. What's wickedness? Cruelty. When you are cruel, you are wicked. And you oppress. And you torment. And you oppress other people and they complain. They say, this is hurting me. That's wickedness. Covetousness. And you know covetousness? Why is it they have it? I don't have it. And those who are covetous, eventually you will steal. Because if that covetousness continues, in your mind and your heart and your spirit and your soul, everything will be panting after it, longing after it. I want it. I want it. I want it. If you don't give it to me, I'll take it by any means. You'll get to stealing. 
malicious and malice, the bitterness of their, the hatred in the heart, and full of envy, jealousy, murder, by abortion, or any other means, debate, argument with the word of God. Did you hear what they said the other time about Christian dressing? Do I agree? Do you think I'm going to do that? Uh, they talk about worldliness. Well, uh, do, you, do you think that it's everything they say over there when they are preaching and agree ways? Hey, come on now. Let us discuss it. Let us debate it. You know, if you look at it from this angle, and from this angle, and from this angle, I about that other church. I about that other place. I about other people that are not. Had. I about those who are not in deeper life. Debate is sin. When you hear the word of God, and you are debating it, instead of obeying it, that's sin, deceit, lying, hypocrisy. Malignity. You malign other people. You destroy other people. Whisperers. Don't say I told you. Gossiping. Backbiting. Backbiters. Haters of God. Despiteful. Proud. See this? Pride. It's also seen. Boasters. Inventors of evil things. Disobedient to parents. Watch. I thought our teachers told us in the school, young people, listen to me. Our teachers said, don't worry. Disobedience. You're teenagers. And this is, the kind, this is the period of life when normally young people are rebellious. It's a normal thing. No, it's abnormal. God will not mind. Yes, he will mind. That disobedience, you are still teenagers, you are young people, uh -uh, no matter how safe you are. There is no way you can avoid being disobedient because that is your age. Because you are teenagers, you must disobey. No sir, that is sin. And you see these uh, teachers and these leaders or whatever, these people that are turning the Bible upside down and they are turning the heads of our children, of our youths. And they are telling them disobedience to parents is alright because they see young people. It is sin. And they need the blood of Jesus to cleanse them and to transform them and to change them from that life of disobedience so that they will be able to get free from the sin. And then it says without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implied Implacable, unmerciful. You know what it means to be implacable? Somebody has offended you. He realized it. And he came to you, knelt down, prostrated, and pleaded with you, my brother, my sister, please, say, go your way. When somebody offends me like that, I must take my pound of flesh. I must retaliate before I can release you. No matter. You can kneel down there for years. I'm still going to do what I want to do. Implacable. It's a sin. And then it says in verse 32, Who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of them, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. How do you get free from all those sins? We we'll come to Romans chapter 3, verse 23 downwards. It says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth, to be a propitiation through faith in his blood. That is a covering for your sin. A cleansing for your sin. It is a sin that will appeal to the mercy of God because your sin has been visited on the Lord Jesus Christ and he has shed his blood for you. That's why it says through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission, the removal, the forgiveness, the pardon of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. And that's what the blood of Jesus Christ does. We're told in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7. Ephesians chapter 1, I'm reading to you from verse 7. Here he tells us, Ephesians 1, 7, in whom we have redemption through his blood. We have it now when we believe. We have it now when we repent. We have it now when we turn to the Lord and we say, yes, I believe. I'm turning away from my sins. And it's the blood of Jesus that will cleanse me and purge me and set me free from all sin. It says, over here, in whom we have redemption. Through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches, according to the riches of his grace. Ephesians chapter 2. Verse 13, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 13. 
But now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off and made nigh near by the blood of Christ, you are far away because your sin has separated between you and the Lord. It's your sin that made you to be far, far away from the Lord. You are not a child of God. You are a child of the devil. And as Satan is far away from God, so the sinner, who is the child of the devil, is far away from the Almighty God. But now, because of the blood of Jesus, when you turn away from your sin, and you reject sin, and you reject self, and you reject Satan, and you say, yes, I'm coming to the Lord, and you say, I have not, nothing in my hand I bring. Simply to the cross I cling. Rock of ages left for me, let me hide myself in thee. Could my tears forever flow, and could my zeal no respite know. All this for sin cannot atone. Thou and thou alone must save. That's what we are talking about. That when you come like that, depending and trusting and leaning and having faith in the blood of the Lamb, in the blood of Jesus, all your sins are washed away. And the Spirit of God will bear witness in your heart that the Lord has had your prayer. And the Lord has pardoned you. And the Lord has changed your life. You are now in Christ, a new creature. All things are passed away. All things have become new by the cleansing of the blood of Jesus. That's what it says there. Now it says you are far away, but now you are made near and you are reconciled by the blood of Christ. For he, in verse 14, is our peace. Who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself one of, of twain, one new man, so making peace. And that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereof. You see, that's what the Lord has done for us. He has taken our sins away. He has cleansed us and purged us by the blood that Jesus shed on the cross of Calvary. And that's why the uh, people of God are praising God in Revelation chapter 1, glorifying Him because He has washed us from our sins. Revelation chapter 1, I'm reading to you from verse 5. It says, and from Jesus, who is the faithful witness, and the first begotten of the dead, the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. He washed us from our sins in his own blood. Have you been to Jesus for that cleansing power? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you fully trusting Him? There is grace this hour. Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Have you been to the Lord? Have you prayed to Him? Have you claimed the efficacious cleansing power in the blood of the Lamb? Have you been washed from your sin? Are you walking daily by the Savior's side? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Do you rest each moment in the crucified? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? When the bridegroom cometh, will your robes be white, pure and white, in the blood of the Lamb? Will your soul be ready for the mansion's bride? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? And now lay aside. And you want to be washed in the blood of the Lamb. And you want the blood of Jesus to be efficacious for you. Lay aside the garments that are stained with sin. And be washed. Be washed. Be washed in the blood of the Lamb. There's a fountain flowing for the soul unclean. Oh, be washed in the blood of the Lamb. And that's what the Lord is telling you. And the Lord is asking you the question. You've been coming over and over for such a long time. But are you washing the blood? In the soul cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Really? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Because there's power in this blood. And it is a power in the blood of Jesus Christ that can make you as white as you ought to be. Would you be free from your burden of sin? There's power in the blood. Power in the blood. Would you over evil the victory win? There's wonderful power in the blood. Would you be free from your passion and pride? Would you be free from your passion and pride? 
How many people are still going about? They have not been cleansed from their pride. They are proud in the house. They are proud in the family. They are proud to their parents. They are proud to their children. They are proud to their neighbors. They are proud to members of the church. They are proud about their facial look. They are proud about their dressing. They are proud about their job. They are proud about everything you can think about. And they still say they are born again. How can you be born again with the pride in their heart? Is it not the humility that shows that the grace of God is in your life? Would you be free from your passion and pride? There is power in the blood, power in the blood. Come for a cleansing to Calvary's tide. There is wonderful power in the blood. Will you be whiter, much whiter than snow? There is power in the blood, power in the blood. Sin stains and loss in its life-giving flow. There is wonderful power in the blood. Would you do service for Jesus, your King? There is power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you live daily his praises to sing? There is wonderful power in the blood. There is power. Yes, there is power. I say there is wonderful work, wonder walking power. In the blood of the Lamb, there is power, power, wonder walking power in the precious blood of the Lamb. That's why the Lord is inviting you and the Lord is telling you, if you really want to be clean, you want to be holy, you want to be righteous, come to the fountain of the blood of Jesus and dip yourself by faith in that blood. And let the blood of Jesus by faith drip upon you. And and all the stain and all the sp- and all the blemish, every sin will be cleansed away from you. He gives you salvation, number two. He gives you sanctification. That leads me to point number two. Sanctification through sanctification and purity through the blood of Jesus. Sanctification and purity through the blood of Jesus. As we look at John chapter 17. John Chapter 17. You see, Jesus Christ, as I told you, this was the very last week of his of his uh, sojourn on the earth. And he should have been thinking about his sorrow, about his suffering, about his betrayal, about his crucifixion. And yet something was uppermost in his heart. He didn't want to leave his own disciples the way they were. Yes, they were saved. They were born again. They had eternal life. And external sins have been taken away from their lives. But they were not sanctified. And we know it by reading all the accounts in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. About their arguments with one another. Who is going to be the greatest? We know they were not sanctified. About wanting to rain down fire on Samaria. We know they were not sanctified. And about, can I see it on this side? And then we'll see it on the other side. We know they were not sanctified. About opposing the will of of the Father concerning Jesus Christ When he said, I'm going to go to the cross and I'm going to die And he said, and Peter said, no Lord, that will not happen to you By not aligning his own will with the will of the Almighty God We know he wasn't sanctified Yes, we have evidence in the New Testament Those disciples before this time, they were not sanctified They were not eternally pure And who shall ascend to the hill of the Lord? Who shall dwell in his holy hill? They that have clean hands, salvation, and a pure heart. How are we going to see God? Follow peace with all men, salvation, and holiness, sanctification, without which no man shall see the Lord. Abstain from all appearance of evil, salvation, and the very God of peace sanctify you holy, sanctification. For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that sanctification, that you know how to keep your vessel from fornication, salvation. You see, as you go into the word of God, you'll find that salvation alone is not enough. There must be sanctification, purity of heart. Because without that purity of heart, you'll not be able to see the Lord. And you'll worship in vain. That's why sanctification is provided by the shedding of the blood of Jesus Christ. In John chapter 17. John chapter 17. Can I start reading from verse 2 with you? John chapter 17 verse 2. As thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. Give eternal life to as many as you have given him. That's salvation. 
That's being born again. That's having eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That's salvation. And this is life eternal that they might know thee, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom thou hast said. For seeds have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. Out of the world. Out of the world. They have come out of the world. That's salvation. Thine they were, and thou gavest them me, and they have kept thy word. That's salvation. Then he tells us in verse, uh, in verse 14, I've given them thy word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, even as I'm not of the world. That's salvation. And he repeats it in verse 16, they are not of the world, even as I'm not of the world. That is salvation. They were born again. But... That's not all. That's not enough. I don't steal anymore. That's not enough. I don't go out to a prostitute anymore. That's not enough. I don't drink their beer anymore. That's not enough. All the external sins, they have been taken away. That's not enough. I'm righteous. I've done my restitution by the grace of God. That's not enough. That's why in verse 17, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. He was praying for them. And then in verse 20, Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also, which shall believe on me through their word. You see this? That Jesus prayed for those immediate disciples. And then he prayed for those other disciples that those disciples were preached to. Do you see what the Lord is telling us here? He's telling us that after you've got eternal life, after you have been called out of sin, after your sins have been forgiven, after you have been born again, you need the second experience that is given to you by the cleansing and the purifying effect of the blood of the Lamb. Sanctification. It tells us in verse 21 what the evidence will be. It says that they all may be one. There will be unity. There will be no argument. There will be no resistance. There will be no opposition. When there is, when there is sanctification, you will be in unity with the Father, in unity with the Son, in unity with the Holy Ghost, in unity with the leadership in the church, in unity with the members, the believers in the church. And when the Lord is leading the people of God to go deep into the world, you will be united. When the Lord is leading the church to emphasize holiness, you will be united. When the Lord is leading the church to seek the glory of God and to exalt the glory of God, you'll be united. And when the Lord is leading the church to honor Him and to glorify Him and to seek the majesty of God, the honor of God, the glory of the exaltation of God, you'll be united. Because that is one of the evidences of sanctification. That they all may be one. As thou, Father, art in me and I in thee, that thou also, that they also may be one in us. No matter how many they are, if they are all sanctified, they may be 10 or 100, they may be 200 or 1,000 or 10,000 or 20,000 or 50,000. If they are all sanctified, they are going to be united. If you find there is no unity between that husband and that wife, we question their sanctification very much. If you find there's no unity among those uh, workers there, or the leadership of the church, will question their sanctification very much on the basis of scripture. If you find there's a member of the church over there, and whenever you meet together and you are discussing, it's always arguing. It doesn't agree. That thing the pastor said. That thing the pastor preached. That thing they are saying. That thing they are possessing. I don't agree. I don't think I'm not in unity with them. We question their sanctification. That they all may be one. If you find any coordinator while preaching in the district. Ah, here. This is what they said. And this is what they said at the combined service last time. But let me give you my own opinion. Because I differ. You are not united with the people of God. We question your sanctification and you are getting to heaven. Because Jesus said that they all may be one. And that thou father, as thou father, art in me. And I in thee, that they also may be one in us. That the world may believe that thou has sent me. You know what that means? You find sanctified husband, sanctified wife. The way they live at home. 
that their neighbors see them. And without even preaching to them at all, they see the love, they see the fellowship, they see the unity, they see the affection. And he said, whatever it is, this husband and wife, whatever they have, I want to have. I'll follow you to your church. That's an indication. And you find the way husband and wife, the way they are living. And then you find one of the children going to pray in his room, saying, Lord, I see the way daddy and mommy, I see the way they love one another, the way they are united, and the way they are walking according to the word of God. Oh Lord, give me the same kind of salvation, the same kind of experience you have given mommy and daddy, that sanctification. Because that child can see something. Because Jesus said that they may be one as our Father art in me and I in you. That the world may believe that you have sent me. And that's why Jesus Christ went to the cross and that's why he died. He died so that you and I can be sanctified. It tells us in Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews chapter 13, how is this sanctification effected? How is this sanctification accomplished in your life, in my life, in our lives together? It says in Hebrews chapter 13 verse 12, Wherefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without the gate. Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood is suffered without the gate. We understand then. And look at this. If an us, if a husband will go and buy something precious, he raked all the currency, all the money that he had everywhere, and he brought, bought something precious for the wife, and he gave it to the wife. And the wife put it maybe on the ground or somewhere, and the husband came and saw it and said, ah, My wife, see, this thing I bought for you, very, very precious. And all the money I have, all the resources I have, is what I used to buy it. See where you have put it. And then the wife took it and said, okay, I've heard. And then put it in another place, which is as bad as the first place. The husband will not be happy. Jesus is the bridegroom of the church. And the church is a bride. And the Lord Jesus Christ paid a great price to purchase sanctification. If anybody then will be ridiculing sanctification, making jazz of sanctification, and playing with sanctification, after we finish the service, are you sanctified? Making jazz, making fun of holiness and sanctification. You know that one is not a friend of Jesus. If you are a friend of Jesus, if you are a lover of the Lord, this precious thing that he bought and purchased with his precious blood, Jesus also, that he might sanctify, that he might purify, that he might make holy the people with his own blood, is suffered without the gate. Let us go forth, therefore, unto him, bear it without the camp, Bearing his reproach. That's what the Lord is expecting that will do. He's expecting that you count sanctification holiness so precious, so important, and so precious that you'll seek it. Because the blood of Jesus Christ has been shed for you and for me, that you and I might be sanctified. Hebrews chapter 10. In Hebrews chapter 10, I'm reading from verse 10. It tells us in verse 10, by the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus. Jesus Christ once for all. He gave himself. He offered himself. He sacrificed himself. He shared his blood so that by that offering, by that sacrifice, by the shedding of that blood, he might sanctify the people in verse 14. For by one offering, the offering of the body of Jesus, like a sacrifice, as he died on the cross, as he shed his blood, he has perfected forever them that are sanctified. I know that you've heard this before, but well, the what I'm telling you, you're too quick to say, I'm sanctified. Don't say that. Don't say that yet. Go back to the Bible. Check up all the references on sanctification and holiness. Check up the evidence of sanctification in the Bible. Check it up. Hey, don't, don't answer too quickly. Give us your Christian verses. I'm saved. I'm sanctified. Don't say it like that. Think. Meditate. Look at your life. 
looking words. Check up your family life. Check up your life in the office. Check up everything going on in your heart. Check up everything that goes on in your life when we are not there, when we don't see you. And it seems to plan. And it seems to conspire together with other people. Check up. Don't just say, I've got it. I've got it. What if you have not got it? What if the trumpet sounds? And the one that examines us and judges us from heaven, he looks at your life and he says, it's not there. You don't have it. You are not sanctified. And without this, you can't go up in the rapture. What are you going to do when it becomes too late to have it? You regret and the regret will be forever. That's the reason you need to check up. Because it says here in verse 14, it says, For by one offering he has perfected forever them that are sanctified. Look at verse 15. Whereof the Holy Ghost also is a witness to us. For after he had after that he had said before, This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts. That's one of the evidences of sanctification. I will put my laws in their hearts. And there are times that, you know, somebody will do something. I will say, Friend, how have you done this? Is it bad? I didn't know. Why didn't you know? If you have the same experience that we have, if the Lord has written His law in your heart, the same law He has written in your brother's heart, in your sister's heart, if the same thing is written on my heart, as it's written on your heart, and I know, why will you not know? How will you say, well, I'm doing evil, but I don't know. Until they told me, I didn't know, you will know. When the word of God, when the law of God, when the ordinance of God is written on the table of your heart, the sanctification, and it says, this is, a, this is the covenant I will make with them in those days, says the Lord, I will put my laws into their hearts, and into their minds will I write them. How is this now? Come back to Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews chapter 13, reading from verse 20. Now the God of peace that brought again the, from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant. That's it. New covenant, everlasting covenant, the same thing. It is through the blood, the blood of the Lamb, make you Perfect. Stop there for a moment and let's talk together. You know, two friends are talking together. And these two friends are saying, oh, What do you see about all these messages coming out nowadays? You know, every time holiness, every time sanctification, every time obedience, every time loyalty, every time faithfulness to the word of God. Uh, the other one replies, Well, the, uh, the pastor is thinking about perfection. Perfection. He's a perfectionist. And, uh, well, let him keep on preaching sanctification every Sunday and every month, throughout the year, all the years. Well, I hope somebody will go and tell him that it is not possible. Nobody will be perfect. My dear friend, you are an unbeliever. You disrespect the blood of Jesus. You dishonor the blood of Jesus. You belittle the blood of Jesus. You are an unbeliever sitting with believers in the church you don't believe the bible you don't believe the word of god it says that he will make you perfect in every good work to do his will that's the reason he sanctifies us that's the reason he shed his blood that's the purpose that's the goal. That's what the Lord wants to accomplish. And if you are discouraging other people, and you are belittling the word of God, and you are showing that you are an unbeliever, why are you there? Why are you coming to a place where they preach it and they read it? It gives you more condemnation. It will have been better for you, although God will still punish the sinner, but all the same, it will have been better for you not to have heard than after you have heard to trample on it under your feet. Now, the God of peace, 
that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do his will, walking in you that which is well pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. And everybody said, Amen. And you see, that's what the Lord is telling us. He's telling us that if you want to be sanctified, it's through the blood of Jesus. You want to be cleansed through and through, it is through the blood of Jesus. You want to be washed whiter than snow, it is through the sanctifying power of the blood of Jesus that removes all in what sin and it stands the divine nature on the heart. By faith in the blood, you are sanctified, you are made holy, and it makes an end of sin. By his precious blood. It tells us in First John chapter 1 verse 7. First John chapter 1. And in verse 7, it tells us there, First John chapter 1 verse 7, But if we walk in the light, if we walk in the light, if we walk in the light, you cannot just say, I want to be sanctified, without first of all getting saved and walking in the light. You are born again. After you are born again, all the light of the gospel you have received, you are walking in it before you come for sanctification. You see, there are some people, they come to the church, they're still telling lies, and they're still stealing, and they're still fighting, and they're still getting angry, and they're still doing all the works of the devil and the works of sinners. And they hear about sanctification, and they say, Lord, sanctify me, sanctify me. No, not like that. First of all, you get saved. You repent of your sin. If there are restitutions to make, you make those restitutions. You are walking in the light. If we walk in the light, as sea is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. Mother, don't jump the queue and don't jump the step. You must be born again first, and you must be walking in the light first to show that you have the grace of God that is given us salvation. Then he says, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. That's talking okay about being cleansed from being what sin, from being what pollution, after you have been born again. I come to point number three, the security and the protection of believers from judgment. The security and the protection of believers from judgment. Here he tells us now, you remember in the Old Testament, when those people, when they were in Egypt, and the judgment was falling upon every house, and the judgment was falling in the whole land of Egypt, how did the people of God, the children of Israel, how did they escape the judgment of God, the wrath of God, the indignation of God, by the blood of the Lamb? When I see the blood, I will pass over you. And the plague will not come upon you to destroy you. When I visit the land of Egypt, or the plague, or the judgment. You look at Romans chapter 5, verse 9. Romans chapter 5, I'm reading to you from verse 9. Here he tells us how we're saved from the wrath to come, from the judgment of God. In Romans chapter 5, verse 9, much more than being now justified by his blood. We shall be saved from wrath through him. Wrath. Wrath. You know what it calls wrath? It's the judgment of God. And that's, uh, that's not the first time that the apostle will use the word wrath in the epistle to the Romans. Look at chapter 1 verse 18. But the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. It's talking about judgment. Talking about the condemnation that will come upon sinners that have not repented. But it says, it is the blood of the Lamb. And Jesus Christ is life. A substitutionary sacrifice for you and for me that you hold on to. That you believe. That you accept. That you embrace. That will make you free from the wrath to come. You, you remember the story. Read it yourself. Exodus chapter 12. In Exodus chapter 12, this is where it is coming from. That you are secured and you are protected and you are preserved by the blood of the Lamb. From the devastating judgment that is to come upon the people of the world on the final day. Here is where it came from. Exodus chapter 12. In Exodus chapter 12, I'm reading from verse 11. Exodus 12, verse 11. And thus shall ye eat it, with your loins girded, 
your shoes on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. If the Lord is going to pass over you, if the judgment is going to pass over you, then it must be that we are staying under the protection of the blood of the Lamb. For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night. I will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgment. I am the Lord, and the blood shall be to you for a token, for a sign, for a symbol upon your houses, the houses where ye are. When I see the blood, I will pass over you, and the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. That's how to escape the judgment of God, by the protection, the preservation, the security that you have under the blood of the Lamb, the blood of Jesus. In Zechariah chapter 9, Zechariah chapter 9, and see what the Lord is saying concerning the blood of the covenant. The one that preserves you, the one that shields you, the one that covers you from the judgment to come is Zechariah chapter 9 verse 11 Zechariah chapter 9 I'm reading to you from verse 11 As for thee also, by the blood of thy covenant have I sent forth thy prisoners out of the pit wherein is no water. What does that mean? These were people that they had held in captivity and they were taking them as something you call the prisoners of war. And because they judged them guilty, condemned, they put them in this dungeon, in the pit where there's no water, so that at the time of the execution of judgment, they'll bring them out and they'll visit them with judgment. But now it says, by the blood of the covenant, by the blood of the covenant, I have sent forth thy prisoners out of the pit. That is, they are set free. No more judgment will come upon them because of the blood. In Romans chapter 8, verse 31. Romans chapter 8, verse 31. Here he tells us, uh, as he even begins in verse 1, he says, There is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. He explains further in verse 31, What shall we say then to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? After we have believed on the Lord, and the blood of Jesus Christ has cleansed us, if God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him all for us all, and shed his blood for you and for me, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again. Who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us? When you are believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, your sins are washed away because of the shedding of the blood of Jesus for you. This is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for the remission of your sins, the sins of many. And when you are believed on that, then you pass from condemnation. No more judgment now. You pass from death unto life. And there is no more condemnation, and there is no more judgment anymore, as you remain clean and pure and holy under the mark of the blood of the Lamb. In John chapter 5, John chapter 5, reading in verse 24, John chapter 5, verse 24, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word, and believeth on him that sent me, has everlasting life, and shall not come into condemnation. You hear that? Shall not come into condemnation. Because you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, because you believe on the blood that was shed for you. And then we're told that the latter part of that verse 24, but is passed from death unto life. Is passed from death unto life. That means no more judgment, no more wrath, the indignation of God, no that's gone, because now you are saved by the cleansing of the blood of Jesus. And you are protected and preserved by the preservation and the protection and the security of the blood of Jesus. It tells us in First Thessalonians chapter 1. 
First Thessalonians chapter 1, reading from verse 10. And to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. You want to be free from the wrath to come? Jesus, who delivered us from the wrath to come. When others are being judged and they are being thrown to hell, you want to escape the damnation of hell, we're delivered from the damnation of hell, from the wrath to come, through the blood of Jesus Christ, who died for us and delivered us from the wrath to come. That's why it says in uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 9, For God has not appointed us unto wrath. You are born again. God has not appointed us unto wrath. Your sins are washed away by the blood of the Lamb. God has not appointed you then unto all. And now you are living a holy life, a clean life, a righteous life by the continual cleansing of the blood of the Lamb. Then God has not appointed us unto all. But to obtain salvation, salvation, salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. But you know it doesn't end there. In verse 20, in verse 22, abstain from all appearance of evil. Anything that appears to be evil. May not even be total evil, complete evil. It appears to evil, to be evil. It has an appearance of evil. Are you not cleansed by the blood of the Lamb? Are you not saved by the blood of the Lamb? Don't you profess and testify and witness you are a child of God because you are cleansed by the blood of the Lamb? Then abstain from all appearance of evil and the very God of peace. Sanctify you wholly. Sanctify you entirely. Sanctify you completely. And I pray God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he that calleth you who also will do is he able? I said, is he able? Yes, he is able. He can do it. In Hebrews chapter 12, Hebrews chapter 12, I'm reading from verse 22. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 22. Here it says, But ye are come unto Mount Zion, and unto the city of the living God, and the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels, and to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven unto God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect, and to Jesus the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood. And to the blood, you come to Jesus, and you come to the blood, the blood of sprinkling, that speaketh better things than that of Abel. In the case of Abel, his blood was calling for condemnation and judgment on Cain. But the blood of Jesus speaks better things than the blood of Abel, because the blood of Jesus is calling for your cleansing. It's calling for your forgiveness. It's calling for your pardon. It's calling for your peace. It's calling for your salvation. Not only that, the blood of Jesus is provided for your purity, for your sanctification, for security, for protection. That's why it says, the blood of Jesus speaketh better things than the blood of Abel. As the Lord has revealed this to you, what are you thinking about? What are you going to do? Are you not going to come to the Lord? And are you not going to pray, wash me, O Lamb of God, wash me from sin. By thine atoning blood, O make me clean, purge me from every stain. Let me thine image gain in love and mercy reign over all everything within me. It's going to be done through the blood of the Lamb, the blood of Jesus Christ. Wash me, O Lamb of God. Wash me from sin. I long, I desire, I'm passionate about it. I want to be like you, all pure within. Now, listen to this. This song had been written before we were even born into this world. There were people that believed sanctification, that believed that we can be pure without and pure within. Pure through and through and pure entirely. And there were people before you and before me, they prayed for this experience and they said, Lord, I desire, I'm longing, I'm passionate about it. I want to be all pure within. And then it says, now let the crimson tide shed from thy wounded side, be to my heart applied. Make me clean, wash me, O Lamb of God, wash me from sin. I cannot rest, I will not rest, till pure within. Do you say that? Do you act like that? 
Do you pray like that? Do you talk to God like that? I will not rest. I cannot rest until I am pure within. You see all those things in your heart. You see all the pollution in the heart. You see all the defilement in the heart. You see the Adamic nature in the heart and you rest. And you don't pray. And you can, after we finish the service, a minute is gone and you go. You will not go like that today. I said you will not go like that today. How can you come? How can you come over here? And the Lord is saying, I shed my blood. I want to purify you until you are totally pure within. And then your others are praying. And then you are, you know, just uh, behaving like as if you are a baby. As if you don't know your left from your right. As if you don't know what will qualify you to get to heaven. Wash me, O Lord. Wash me, O Lamb of God. Wash me from sin. I will not rest. I cannot rest until I'm pure within. All human skin is faith. But thou canst cleanse each stain till not a spot remain made holy clean. Wash me, O Lamb of God, wash me from sin. By faith, thy cleansing blood now makes me clean. So near art thou to me, so sweet my rest in thee, O blessed purity, blessed holiness, blessed sanctification, saved, saved from sin. Wash me, O Lamb of God, wash me from sin. Thou, while I trust in thee, I need to have faith in the Lord. I trust in thee. Will keep me clean. After you have sanctified me, then temptations will come. You will keep me clean. Opposition will come. You will keep me clean. And then it it says, each day, to thee I bring my heart, my life. Yes, everything. Saved while to thee I clean. Saved from sin. From all sin. The Lord has given you the word today. You will not say you have not heard. When Isaiah saw the glory of God, he had been saved. And then he said, oh, I am undone. And I live among people that have unclean lips. And then because he was passionate, because he was desirous, because he said, Lord, do it for me. Then the Lord did it for him, and the Lord sanctified him. Why don't you allow the Lord to do it for you today? He will do it. I said he will do it. Nobody going home now. Nobody roaming about now. This is for young good. This is for you to get to heaven. You rise up and you will pray. You will spend time in prayer. In, uh, in prayer before the Lord. You are telling the Lord, if you are not born again yet, Lord, I want to be born again. Lord, I want to be saved. Young people, you have to pray. Men, you have to pray. Women, you have to pray. This is for your own sake. This is for your own sake. This is for your own sake. How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? And how are we going to get to heaven if there's no holiness, if there's no sanctification? Talk to the Lord in prayer. Talk to the Lord in prayer. And say, Lord, those people sitting down in the front, I want you to rise up. This is for the Lord. You are not doing it for me. This is between you and the Lord. You are telling the Lord, Lord, I want to be saved. Lord, I want to be cleansed. Lord, I want to be pardoned. Lord, I want all my sins to be taken away. All the lying, all the cheating, all the adultery, all the fornication, all the hypocrisy. Cleanse it away from me. I want to be saved. I want to really know the Lord. If you have been born again, you are sure about it. And you are walking in the light, in the light of the gospel. You are telling the Lord, I want to be sanctified. I want to be purified. I want to be made holy. Until I'm totally pure within. Totally pure within. Tell the Lord. Tell the Lord, He wants to do it now. He wants to do it now. He wants to do it now. Position will not replace purity. Let Him purify you. Service will not replace sanctification. Let Him sanctify you. And it's not a make believe experience, a real experience. A real experience. Talk to the Lord in prayer. Talk to the Lord in prayer. Talk to the Lord in prayer. Oh Lord, I come. Oh Lord, I come. Wash me. Wash me. Wash me. Wash me from sin. I don't want to come here in vain. Wash me from sin. I don't want to worship in vain. Cleanse me from sin. Change my life. Change my heart. Do something within me. Do it, O Lord. I want it. I desire it. I'm longing for it. I'm passionate about it. Oh Lord, have mercy on me. Give me grace. Help me. Help me, Lord. Help me, Lord. Let him do it. Let him do it.
This is more important than any other appointment you have today. This is the most important thing. This is the most important thing. If you rush out and you go to do those other things you wanted to do, will those things take you to heaven? Will those things take you to heaven? How can you be coming Sunday after Sunday and there's no salvation? How can you be coming Sunday after Sunday and there's no grace of God? How can you be coming Sunday after Sunday and there's no righteousness? How can you be coming week after week and there's no change of life? Oh Lord, do it for me today. Lord, do it for me today. Lord, do it for me today. Let the Lord do it. Let the Lord do it. You know the condition of your heart. You know the condition of your heart. You know the bitterness in your heart. You know the malice in your heart. You know the hatred in your heart. You know all the things that Satan is planting in your heart. And you're not able to live a victorious life. An overcoming life. Why don't you tell the Lord today? Today is today. Let the blood of Jesus cleanse me. Let the blood of Jesus make me clean. Wash me as white as now, whiter than snow. Let the Lord do it. Let the Lord do it. Let him make you a new creature. A new creature in Christ. A new creature in Christ. After you are saved, you need sanctification. You need purifying of your heart. You need holiness of heart. Purity of heart. Let the Lord do it. It's not a, sanctification is not only for workers. It's for everyone that wants to get to heaven. It's not only for leaders in the church. Sanctification is all for those who want to get to heaven. Don't let the devil deceive you. I'm not a worker. I'm not a leader. Therefore, I don't need it. You need it to get to heaven. Follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. This is greater than healing. This is greater than deliverance of people are running about for. You can get healed if you are not free from sin, you will not get to heaven. You may get delivered and yokes broken, now you are prospered, you have money, you have car, you have everything. If you are not holy, you will not get to heaven. You may have children, you may have wife, you may have whatever. If you are not holy, you will not get to heaven. This is more important than any other blessing you are seeking for. Lord, make me holy. Lord, make me pure. Lord, make me holy. Lord, make me pure. Make me righteous through and through, within and without. Outwardly and inwardly, make me holy. As holy as you can make me. I need it. I want it. Sanctify me. Let the Lord do it. When the Lord does it, you will know the Spirit of God will bear witness in your heart that now you are saved and you are sanctified. Let the Lord do it. Let the Lord do it. This is very important for you if you want to get to heaven. Follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. This is the will of God for you, even your sanctification. 